So, welcome everybody. I'm going to uh, have a small presentation about security automation. So, firstly, for my general overview and for my expectation management, for me to see what type of audience we have. So, who of you are pen testers? Or hackers? Or... Sorry? Nice, Milan. I like. So, software developers. Consultants? Yeah, more or less, sort of. Okay, cool. So, initially my idea was to... So normally this talk is more about the SSLC, how you set up your security requirements and implement your security tooling uh, to your customers or your own CICD pipelines and all that good stuff. Now I wanted to have a more general approach because this also really applies for uh, basically whenever you want to do some offensive as a service stuff or whatever, so that was also really really comes in handy there. Um, so basically some gibberish about me. I'm a security consultant, hacker, trainer, speaker, blah. I do uh, some awesome stuff uh, at OWASP. I'm a quirky leader there. And I'm, as you can tell, I'm a bit quirky. So please give, you, give your time, yourself the time to get accustomed to me so I can also get accustomed to you. And the moment you can't figure I get accustomed to you is when I start swearing. So <laughs> sorry for that in advance. So this is also me. I am uh, a People might have guessed already, I'm kind of chaotic and I go all over the place. So that very often leads to procrastination. So yesterday evening I still wanted to work on some stuff for this presentation today. While I ate a Napoleon, chipped my tooth and got really anxious to go to the dentist. You can imagine I did shit from there. So yeah, that's me. So I prefer doing all my stuff in a dent line and do panic, but hey, don't we all? So when doing security automation, I ran into some issues and one of those issues is security automation can be really, 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 really hard because you have all these bits and pieces and you have to put all these bits and pieces together to get some big piece to do some sort of stuff you want. In this case, it's security test automation. And what I really found out when I started doing this, uh, yeah, like... Nine months ago, I really found out that this business isn't really matured yet. So there's a lot of hassles we still have to go through and a lot of hoops we have to get through to really get, yeah, really get the pipeline we want. And also one fundamental difference there is one good colleague of mine, Jeroen, when I started working at Xavier, he once told me, dude, there's pets and there's cattle. So to basically set this whole setup as a pet, so where you have like, uh, for instance, you have Jenkins and you have your plugins and you configure all your plugins by hand and then there you have your security test automation in Jenkins. And then you have a nice pet. As soon as that instance decides to go down, then all your work is gone and you can start from scratch. Or at some point when I was in this company building the security pipeline, they said, oh yeah, Jenkins is all good and stuff, but uh, yeah, we're going to switch to GitLab. So I saw all my work go straight into the bin lot and I could start work all over again. So that's why for me as a consultant, it's also <laughs> very interesting and very important to uh, have this agnostic solution where I can simply take all my bits and pieces and all my building blocks and put that, for instance, in a Jenkins or in a GitLab or in a VSTS or in a whatever, you give it a name and you can easily put it in there. So for me, that was the hassle on the whole security test automation because it was kind of hard. But now let's talk some benefits. So especially for software development, if you have your security test automation pipeline, so whenever a developer does a commit or uh, they, they push something new to an acceptance environment or whatnot, you can instantly uh, yeah, kick off all your security tooling and have a general baseline about what that says about their security. So this doesn't find in-depth shit, this doesn't find uh, very complex vulnerabilities, this does not find logic flaws, but because Security tooling obviously does not have any context about the application, so it will not find logic flaws, so it's not uh, um, a silver bullet in that sense. Also, keep in mind, when somebody tries to sell you security tooling, and they say, I had this good conversation once with an oak who said, yeah, my stuff finds 90% of the OS top 10. And I was like, oh, 
Really, that's interesting because if you look at insecure direct object reference, it's a logic flaw and your tool will probably not find that. So that's 80%. You're lying to me, mate. Uh, so really, security tools do not know the context of the application. So they will probably not find logic flaws and very complicated attacks. So please keep that in mind. However, if you look at the biggest threat on the internet being, of course, automated attacks. So it will cover you very, very good against automated attacks, depending on what you have in your pipeline, of course, because if you only run your Nmap scan, for instance, then uh, you're probably not fending yourself against automated attacks. But if you have all the tooling together in the right context of all the different services you have running, or the different applications you're building, you're kind of good to go. Never 100%, of course, because when somebody tells you something is 100% secure, he's probably lying. So, like I said, <coughs> normally I talk about the SSDLC because I am really into uh, application security and software development, so that's where my biggest passion goes to and that's why I mostly tell about SSDLC. Don't get me wrong, I really, really, really love destroying shit and kicking shit over and do pen tests and that stuff. But I'm also very interested to see, uh, in most cases, how it works when you start helping developers also, yeah, mitigate their vulnerabilities and effectively uh, build secure software. So that was also the whole idea why I started doing the STF, the Security Knowledge Framework, to basically yeah, guide developers and give them hand, uh, handles on how to build secure software. So this is, for me, ideally how a good software security development cycle looks like. So we first start with test automation because that says a whole lot of stuff about code quality. And code quality, you have dead end code, over complex code, um, code complexity. If you have a very complex code base, it's kind of hard whenever there has been a penetration test to make new iterations over that and do bug fixing. So if you have a clean code base, you can do faster iterations, you can solve bugs faster, and there's also a less probability you will probably have some sort of logic flaws in your code, right? So second step then would be the security test automation. So the security test automation, for me, uh, the most important pillars are SOS and DOS. So if you're static code analyzers and your dynamic code analyzers, a little while ago I also said something about EOST. Yeah, I really have to look into that to see if that's interesting. But for me, yeah, these two are very interesting. So with static code analyzer tools, then you have your your I was just told to move to this side. Sorry, didn't know that. I like to walk around a lot. So for your static code analyzers, we have uh, stuff like NPM audits or your dependency check or um, fortify check marks, Veracode to do uh, sync to source analysis, source to sync. And of course, also to do the dependency check, as Niels already told, like, hey, whenever you are using these types of libraries, are there already known vulnerabilities for these libraries? Because who of you knows what a CVE is? Awesome, that's more than <laughs> I expected. Okay, now for all the people who don't know, so as soon as a security, uh, security researcher finds a security vulnerability in a piece of software, there is this big open organization he can uh, basically send his write-up to after he, of course, notified the vendor, gave the vendor some chance, uh, some time to fix his vulnerabilities and all that good stuff to post this white paper to, and then they will give it an ID. And then there's this whole big database of all these vulnerabilities. And basically what happens is when you run this scanner, it will look at all the dependency your application has, compares all the versions that are in your libraries against what it sees in that big ass database where all the CVEs are in, and then correlates those vulnerabilities to those libraries. And it basically tells you like, hey, I see you're using this library. It probably has this vulnerability. Please upgrade to this version of your library, or it says, nope, this is out of date, this is no longer being supported, please throw it in the bin lot and use something else or patch it or whatever else. So that's basically what your SOS tooling does, and DOS tooling we have OSEP for instance. So this is a dynamic tool who actually on a low level tries to do attacks like a hacker would normally do in your application. That's basically how you must see it. So you have this in case of Zap, you have this proxy, headless browser, and it starts doing cross-site scripting, cross-site request forgery. It checks 
configuration for your course. It tries server-side template injections. Whatever hell somebody once came up with, they put it in a tool and the tool checks for it. Pretty darn awesome. And as soon as it measures request response, and as soon as it says like, hey, I see this use of supply inputs, but it's being reflected back in the application. Ah, this looks like XSS. You might want to look into that. So that's what your dynamic analysis tool does do. And then you also have open false, nests, and all that good stuff, right? Uh, yeah, so we have a list for sauce, we have a list for dust. I kind of went into this. So what we want to achieve with our security automation framework is we want to have some sort of a glorified task scheduler. And since most people, our organizations are already using stuff like Jenkins, GitLab, Travis, VSTS for their continuous integration and continuous deployment stuff, we can easily hook into here and then run our, uh, our security tooling from here, right? Because here from the developers, who is using, who, who is doing CI CD? Continuous integration, continuous development. Well, that's pretty darn awesome because if you're already doing this, the step to security test automation is rather small, right? Because you can easily hook in your security tools in your CI CD uh, pipeline. Separate pipelines though, because I've seen situations where you put your security tools in the developer pipelines and then you have things like OpenFoss or maybe Zap who run like six hours. So you have to wait six hours before your shit gets deployed. No, nobody got time for that. So then what you simply get is as soon as me as a consultant leaves the office, they be like, oh, fuck that hook. We kick out that tool because, oh my God, it takes six hours to, to run. So you also, if you do that, you're counter achieving what you want to achieve. So please, if you're integrating security test automation pipelines, make a separate pipeline because yeah, then it's not a, a showstopper for developers, right? So basically, it has to go seeming, seamlessly into what they already have. So the, the developers who do not want to do anything with security should not be bothered by it. The only thing they should see is, yeah, in some case, there will be an extra ticket in their Jira and pop up in their sprint and they'd be like, oh, I have to fix this SQL injection. That might be pretty important. Oh, let's do this, yay. So they are not bothered because as soon as they get bothered and builds get stopped, as soon as you leave the office, they will throw out your tools outside of the pipeline. So this is basically, uh, so as I mentioned, my, my first proof of concept was where I had Jenkins and where I configured all my security tools manually. How many people here work with Docker? How many people here know what Docker is? Ah, oh, awesome. I was afraid I had to explain what Docker was. <laughs> yeah, I was the same thing. I told myself, oh, please, please do not have to explain what Docker is. Like I said, ain't nobody got time for that. Kubernetes? Yeah, everybody's familiar, kind of familiar. Okay, so where you have Docker and you have your containers, yeah? Then you have Kubernetes, that is a layer on top of your, uh, let's, let's, it, it's an orchestration tool for your containers. Yeah, so it orchestrates your containers. Pretty darn awesome. So this was what my first setup. So I had my Jenkins and through Jenkins, I deployed Docker containers and those Docker containers, they, uh, we're wrapped around my security tooling. So this could be Zap, this could be uh, OS dependency check, this could be NPM audit, this could be Nessus or whatever. You wrap your container around it, you deploy it. You're away from all that dependency hell and configuring all that stuff. You could simply run it. And as soon as somebody says, oh, we're kind of done with Jenkins. I want to use GitLab now. Then you don't have to throw everything in the bin lot. So you can simply reuse your containers. That was awesome. So that was nice. But then I started to work with VSCS. And VSCS, they bought like six agents. So at some point I was doing my test runs and all six agents were occupied because like I mentioned, Zap has a tendency to run for like six <coughs> hours if you're out of luck and it's scanning a big ass application. So at some point somebody came up to me and was like, yeah. <laughs> hey, dude, I cannot do, I cannot deploy anymore because your Zap is keeping all our agents occupied. And I was like, oh darn it. I have to look for another solution. And thank God there was Kubernetes. So basically what happens now, I made Kubernetes scripts for uh, all my containers. 
And basically what happens now is Jenkins or VSCS or GitLab or whatever, and because we now have this CI/CD agnostic solution that works for all your CI/CD tooling, um, could simply schedule your pod or your, your Docker container as a pod within Kubernetes, so it will not keep your agents occupied anymore. So whenever I now would run a Zap scan on, for instance, VSCS or Jenkins or uh, fill in the blank, uh, it would take like two minutes and then it's done. And the rest of the shit that runs simply runs on Kubernetes. Oh my God. So now I could run six sub instances. I could run 60 sub instances. Nobody cares because, hey, it's all scalable. It's all tickety boo. It doesn't keep the agents occupied. So everybody was happy again. It did, however, bring an extra level of complexity, but I will show that all in a bit. So. Security tools, and one of the biggest pitfalls in security tools is it has the tendency to generate some false positives from time to time. So at some point they wanted to make insightful all the false positives, and then we had the OWASP benchmark project. Well, this is the, the, the whole uh, graph explained, where you have tools who report that nothing is vulnerable, you have in this false positive rate and true positive rate something that's worse than random. <laughs> Tools report vulnerabilities randomly, the ideal vulnerability detection. Yeah, nobody's even darn close. And tool reports, everything is vulnerable. <laughs> so this is how the graph looks. As you can see, like I said, false positives. There's a whole lot of false positives in here. Mm. It even got in such a worse state that when they brought out the benchmark project, a lot of vendors said, please do not put us on this list. And they called them like K L M N O P Q. <laughs> <laughs> because as you can see, there are a lot of non-commercial tools actually scoring better than some commercial tools. Oh, that's interesting. And if you look at the new version of SEP, that's H, that's right over there. And that's pretty nice with its true positive rate and false positive rate that you can work with. Because as I said, if you look, oh yeah, in bird, bird culture, this will be called good news. <laughs> because it gives you a lot of false positive where you have to go through, you have to iterate through, and oh my God, it can be really, really, really painful, especially for your time. So like I mentioned, so you have this classical vulnerability stuff, right? So where you have your cross-site scripting, SQL injection, cross-site request for GE and all that blah. That's 50%. The other 50% is the logic flaws. So you can imagine if there's only, uh, for a tool like SAP, where you have here this 20%, the 20% of the 50%, which is the classical vulnerabilities and not the logic flaws, right? Then you have a long way to go to effectively cover all the attack service. So again, I really, 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 really want to address to everybody. This is a good fail safe and this is a good baseline to see, yeah, if there are major F ops in your application, right? So this is a good safety net, but you should in no way, shape or form rely on your security tools. So yeah, we saw it was a big move. Um, so luckily there's also Defect Dojo. And Defect Dojo I can use for uh, false positive suppression and Delta reporting. So that's pretty darn nifty. So this is my whole vulnerability management setup. So you can imagine I have this pipeline, I have my security tools, I run my security tools, these tools push metrics, they push the metrics to my vulnerability management tool who looks a bit like this. And from here I can effectively manage all my vulnerabilities. So what happens is when there is a second scan and it sees the same results because hey, it's when there is a false positive or you didn't fix an issue, it will probably get back at you in your next scan iteration, right? Because it is still there. So you don't really want to go through all the results every time you get your scan results back. So that's why it also does Delta reporting. So it basically picks the first scan it made, First is the second scan it made, it makes the correlation, says, ah, this is rubbish, I've already seen this. These are your actual vulnerabilities. And if you mark a vulnerability as a false positive, the next scan, your next iteration, it will see the false positive and then it will say, oh, wait a minute, it was a false positive. Please don't look at this anymore. So that really, really helps you to iterate faster through your vulnerabilities. 
People in your sock will be grateful you told them there is something like the Effect Dojo, even they already figured it out themselves. Hopefully. So, it has, as you can see, it has a nice dashboard, it has nice metrics. When you open the metrics, it also gives you more in that information with the descriptions, solutions. It will tell you, for instance, like I mentioned, in the context of an outdated library, it will tell you, hey, this library was outdated, please update to this version. Or it will say, hey, I found cross site request forgery, please, please. Uh, maybe that's a hard one because for every framework you have different good solutions. Let's go back to cross site scripting. It says, hey, we found cross site scripting. Please encode your user supplied input and always work inside the intended operation of the application. So if you expect an integer, please do your typecasting shit properly. So that's probably what it will tell you when, yeah, it finds these vulnerabilities. So it gives you a description and a solution on how to handle these uh, uh, vulnerabilities, right? Oh, I love this GIF. <laughs> it has no purpose, it has no meaning. But kudos for whoever got those tiny hats and those cats and got them to ring that bell. This. So. <laughs> The next issue I had, and I have everywhere, with people containerizing all the stuff and want to do test automation and want to do CI CD stuff and really have to get their code through all sorts of hoops and quality gates and quality assurance shit and test automation, we see one big issue and that is, oh my god, their API keys are spread everywhere. So you have to remember, <laughs> I see a lot of plain text, usernames, passwords. I see a lot of config files, which are really darn important, which contain really sensitive API keys. I see it in source code and I see it in version control systems. So you can imagine whenever I am sitting somewhere and I doing some sort of pen testing exercise and I coincidentally da, 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 see new attack service because all your API keys are spread around. For instance, your API key to authenticate against your, I don't know, your Jenkins instance, for instance. I can now deploy from there my own containers. Ooh, that's interesting. Or I can all do all other sorts of interesting stuff. You can imagine what impact this has on your company, right? When you have your API keys scattered all around. No? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Makes my job very, very more interesting. So the thing is, we have applications and applications have the tendency to they can't keep secrets very well. A very good example of an application that isn't very good at keeping secrets was when I was doing a pen test and I had a path reversal in this pen test. So effectively, I could read some log files. At first, it was a kind of nice finding, but not really critical, right? So at some point, I found out that they logged, whenever somebody logs into the application, they logged the username and the password. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no. Sorry, it even got uh, more interesting. They only, can you imagine when you're typing in your username? So they thought they were doing it well. It even gets better from here. So they thought they were doing it well. So they were logging the user who was effectively logged in. Yeah. But don't we all have this situation where you were typing too fast? Yeah. And you wanted to tap, but you didn't tap very well and typed in your password in your username field and then tried to submit it. Guess how many usernames and passwords were in that log file? <laughs> so, as I mentioned, uh, applications are very, 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 very bad secret keepers. And they will leak your secrets everywhere. <laughs> so, thankfully we have Vault, yay. So, for instance, uh, I now work a lot with Azure. Azure has Azure Key Vault, but you also have HashiCorp Vault. Which is pretty darn awesome at some point. I always thought like, oh, time-based one-time password system, building one. Oh, my God, it might be a hassle, right? I did it with HashiCorp Vault in like five minutes. It was unbelievable. From reading the demo, like, okay, setting up Vault. Okay, if you wanted to set it up for a demo environment, it was a bit of more work, but you also have this dev, where you, dev instance where you can play around with it for a bit. I had it like in like five minutes. It was brilliant. It even has an endpoint from what I've seen in all the tutorials where you can basically tell Vault, 
hey, I want a cryptographically random secure string. And then you get a cryptographically random secure string. How cool is that? And like, cryptographically random secure. How many people here in the room ever, 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 ever calculated the entropy of your cryptographically random <laughs> secure string to generate? <laughs> oh, fuck, guys, you are awesome. <laughs> These are the first two hands I ever saw go off in a presentation. So, ain't nobody got time for that, right? So, me as a pen tester, I do have time for that because <laughs> it's kind of my job to do. But as a developer, where you have this product owner who's like, oh man, we really want to have more functions, more functions. Yeah, but I really have, no, you need to build more functions. But dude, no, more functions. You don't have time to do an entropy check of the cryptographically random secureness of your strings you use in your application, right? Can I see hands of people who get time for that? If you go to your product owner and say, dude, I really have to check the cryptographically random secureness for my tokens. <laughs> he will probably think of it as an excuse for you to go out and drink more coffee or whatever he thinks you do in the first place anyway. <laughs> so, like I mentioned, there are a lot of benefits to use your vault. Uh, yeah, what I just told just scratches the surface. There's really, really, really more you can do with your key vault. Oh, by the way, fun fact. So when I was building my presentation, I was looking for, you know, everybody talks the talk, but nobody walks the walk. So I saw a lot of good presentations about people conceptually talking about security test automation and all that stuff. So. The, the, the first thing that came to my mind was that scene in the Matrix where Neo wakes up and says, I know Kung Fu. <laughs> and Morpheus leans in and says, show me. <laughs> so I was like, oh, I really want to use that GIF, right? And then at some point I was kind of shocked myself to see what kind of mm, new extra addition they made to that GIF. It's kind of edgy, but I still, pff, fuck it, I do it anyways. I know Kung Fu. <laughs> show me. And then we have this random dude. Have anybody seen him? <laughs> I figured it was kind of edgy to use it, but I use it anyway. <laughs> so, this is kind of the situation where I say, yeah, sorry, not sorry. <laughs> so, like I said, I kind of built this whole setup in VSCS. So I want to kind of get everybody through this and show how it works and really to have good discussions about this. So, who of you here is lost? It's like really like, oh, dude, the oak is talking for like half an hour now, but I really have no idea what he's talking about anymore. Please do not be ashamed because the first six months I was doing this shit, have, has every, anybody seen that, that meme with that dog, with that... Ty, who's sitting at the office, and was like, I have no idea what I'm doing now. That was me the first four or five months. So do not be ashamed that for me, ranting about this in half an hour will result in you thinking like, ah, oh, damn, I'm lost. Nobody? Yeah. So is there anything in particular I can help you with? Or you just want to see the demo first and then <laughs> have all your questions later. That's also fine. But if there's anything I can tell beforehand, that would be pretty awesome. So this is the part where we find out that VSCS doesn't lend itself very much to be zoomed in and see yeah, things closer. Big screen, yeah. You have to get a, that blue or that green bar, get it out. Green and bar? It scales way better. Which green bar? Where it said build. How do I get it away? Uh, Maybe I have to zoom out a bit more. It doesn't <laughs> give me a place to click it away. Click pipelines and click pipeline again. <clears throat> Maybe if I refresh it then, would that help? Might or I might resubmit your job. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> ah, I just want to say, ain't nobody dead dumb too. <laughs> well, assumptions, right? <laughs> but it, uh, yeah, it kind of skills, okay. We can work with this. So basically what I did here is, as I mentioned, now we have VSTS. VSTS has limited agents. So especially when you have this freemium account, which I have right now, where you also have like, so I was building a proof of concept for this customer. And then at some point I found out I had like only 
100 or 1000 build minutes each month, each month, my god, my Dutch stain colon English sometimes. <laughs> so um, yeah, that then become pretty critically that I could run short jobs, right? So at first I ran out of minutes and now I built this whole proof of concept, everything sticky view, do because it all runs with Kubernetes. So basically what happens here, First, I clean off my clean out my pods. So here is my Kubernetes instance. My pods are running here. So you probably want to have some other sort of setup where you instantly de delete your Kubernetes or your your pods with your security tools as soon as you uh, finish running them, right? But yeah, for the sake of example, and uh, because I like I said, I'm kind of a procrastinator who. It's kind of chaotic, so I think, oh, this shit's interesting, and I start doing that. Oh, I still have to make that press. Oh, but that's also very interesting, and then I go all over the place, so I forget things sometimes. Like I'm going all over the place right now. <laughs> so first we clean up our pods, and then we simply deploy our pods. And these pods are being deployed through a configuration file, as you can see here. Um, so what I did here is here is I have here my Azure portal. On this portal, I have my Kubernetes service, I have my vault running, and on an app service, I have Defect Dojo. So everything is passed here. Why? Because I'm lazy and it, yeah, this runs really fast and it's really good for good proof of concept or even if you harden everything out the, the right way for production stuff. So that's pretty darn awesome. So I have this Kubernetes cluster, I have my vault, I have the app service. So. As you can see, here we have our Kubernetes uh, instance, and this is Defect Dojo. As you can see from here, from the slides I show you, they just recently had a nice upgrade where everything is more spiffy and awesome and works way better. In the engagement, first you only had your normal engagements, but now you also have your CI CD engagement. So, really, uh, yeah, split that stuff up. So, that's pretty nice. But I will get into more detail in this later. So, here we have all our. Uh, um, um, Kubernetes deployments. So basically, I give it a name, I say what cluster it should connect to, I um, select here the service connection I have in my pass. So here's beneath the service all this configuration key stuff where it does key exchanges and all that good stuff. So it gets me again authenticated to my Kubernetes instance. And from here, I simply tell it to run a create command and then I let it read from my config file. Now, what is in my config file is not very interesting, so I'll talk you through this really quick. So you have this API version, you have the kind of stuff I want to deploy, in which case is a pod. So this is a pod of my Docker container running on Kubernetes. I give it a name because, hey, yeah, everybody has a name, right? So he wants to have a name also. That's maybe very nice to do. You also have some labels. Labels are also very handy if you want to do something with services and all that good stuff. My in-depth Kubernetes knowledge isn't really that much. I know enough to uh, deploy all my containers and know for security and not how to optimize this. That's a whole different ball game for me. So then, again, the name. We have this image, in this case it's uh, the OS dependency check, and here we have some environment variables. And this is where it kind of gets interesting because it gets these uh, variables, as you can see later if I go back to my pipeline. Like, uh, I don't know if I mentioned it already, but this is my pipeline within VSTS, yeah? So it has a secret key ref. So Defect Dojo also has this, this key storage, right? But this key storage, now, if I want to have my infrastructure as code and I want to, as you can see, if I scroll up, not that much, I can view the YAML. I can view the YAML. Yeah, there is my YAML. So basically what you see here is these secret arguments still have my secrets in it. And that's not the, the thing I want to achieve, right? Well, in this case, it's not very much so because the API key is a placeholder for whatever it gets from my Azure key vault, which I will show in a bit. But so if you want to have your infrastructure as code and you want to import and export all that YAML stuff, then you are quite in trouble now. Because even though Kubernetes has this secret storage, it's not a secret when you're exporting this as a YAML file. So we want to take it one step further, and we could take it one step further if we were to go to the variables. Here we have the predefined variables, and this variables, uh, oh, 
now it sends me to the variable groups. Sorry. So here's my defect dojo secret. <laughs> and it gets this value from my OWASP meetup vault. So it connects to my vault, gets my secret from the vault, uses that as a placeholder, and only uses that as soon as it deploys my Kubernetes or, or my container on my Kubernetes cluster. And even here, and that's the, the brilliant part, if I go back to my here build pipelines and I see my history, <coughs> and let me go to my logs where it deploys my zap pod. I have to scroll around for a small bit, even here. It will not show my secret. So that's pretty darn awesome, right? So it gets a secret for my secret storage and then it uses the secret to deploy my container in the Kubernetes cluster without showing my secret everywhere. So this is the whole reason you want to use this key vault for because you really do not want to have your secrets exposed. But because like I said, as soon as important API keys or whatnot get exposed, it's game over for you. So in the context for Defect Dojo, it might be pretty bad because then they have an overview of all the vulnerabilities these scan tools have found. <laughs> and you can also import uh, results from penetration tests and whatnot, right? So that's a real issue. But if there are the keys to your Docker registry where people can now you push new Docker images to, your CI CD environment will gladly deploy into production for you where you now have poison image running who might or might not attack your clients, yeah, then you might even have a bigger problem. So that's why it's really important to have all your secrets in one central key store, namely, or your HashiCorp vault, or your Azure key vault, or your whatever key vault there is on the market. Please use a key vault, because it is not that much of an extra hassle to use it. So, now we have this whole shebang running, we look at our builds, Again, here you see my pipeline. It does all sort of fancy stuff. So it deploys the dependency uh, zap, it deploys dependency check, and it deploys mm. So as soon as this is done scanning, it will push all the metrics to Defect Dojo. Well, this is Defect Dojo. I'm not going too much into detail. I just want to show you that it's out there and that it helps you manage your vulnerabilities in a nice way. So I can check my engagement details. You see, I have my product, the OWASP meetup. I have my active engagements. Uh, let's check this one out. Go to my engagement. Yes, so here are all the scans I ran so far. And as you can see, because it does the Delta reporting, I hear the findings on my first scan are 10. But then when it runs the second scan, you see for the duplicates, it sees, hey, I have 10 findings from which are 10 are duplicates. So this is a configuration you can make here in your configuration, in your tool configuration, you can simply say, hey, you can also tell it to deduplicate findings. I think it's more insightful to see what actually were the duplicate findings without removing them. It's personal, personal. What's the right word for it? Ah, thanks. That's your personal preference. Sorry, I almost wanted to go Dutch stone calls on you. So that's your personal preference, so whatever you would like. But yeah, I think it's more nicer to not really remove them. So if I now look at this, you can see, hey, I need, might have to zoom out a bit. It says status, it's inactive, and it's a duplicate, and also gives you a link to the original find. So I just ran a dependency check on a random library. I just run zap as a baseline scan on a random thing because if I would run the real deal, it would probably take six hours, which is really nice for demo environments. I could, could by the way, why not run the pipeline? Because it's there, right? So we queue a new scan. So this might take a while. <coughs> Uh, yeah, so now here all my scan results are being uh, collected and uh, from here I can simply say like, hey, this is active, verified, false positive, or it's out of scope. I can also change the severity because sometimes you have a different severity uh, depending on the impact it has on your business, right? 
So the scanning tool might say, ah, this is medium or low impact, but if you look at the actual impact on your business, that might be quite high or critical. So here you can also change the severity. Uh, cherry on the pie, you can so also um, um, move or import all the findings defect Dojo has done directly to Jira, and then it can push some Slack messages or it can send an automatic email like, hey, we found this critical thing you might want to fix. So that also really comes in handy. So let's look, uh, let's look at our build. Where is it showing up? Here. So now it's initializing the agent, initializing the job, and then from there it's going to download the secrets from our Azure Key Vault. Uh, then it's going to delete all our containers. So you saw Kubernetes running, which wasn't actually rerunning because I just simply didn't refresh it anymore. So now if I am correctly, it will start deleting all the different pods we have here. And then from there, it will just simply redeploy them. So now it's deleting Zap. I can probably show Zap will be gone in an instant. Yeah, see it's gone. So it's now not deleting all my containers. So it's cleaning, or all my pods, I should say. So it's cleaning up. And then after a while, it's redeploying the scan ends, pushes all the metrics to Defect Dojo, where your SOC or uh, probably your security champions within your uh, development team or whatever can now look, take a look at these vulnerabilities, do act actual verification if they're actual false positives, uh, yes or no, and then ultimately push the findings back to the backlog of the developers where they can pick it up and fix it. So this whole process, like I said, you now mixed your whole security test automation with the whole development process and it has a means for you as a, a penetration tester or somebody who wants to do some kind of offensive as a service, a means to have this awesome glorified test scheduler to schedule all your security scans for you and have a nice dashboard where you can manage all these vulnerabilities. So it's a win-win for both worlds, right? Like I said, I mostly use it now for integrating it into CICD pipelines, so really for the developer point of view. But I can also see myself when I, whenever I get more uh, uh, offensive engagements also build this framework for my penetration testing. So I do not have to look into running Zap and all that stuff manually again. No, I just schedule it and run it from time to time, especially when it's an occurring job. That's, uh, for instance, you have this engagement where the customer says like, yeah, I want to do monthly checkups. So you can schedule it monthly and that's all good, right? And Please remember, you know, my 50-50 story and now it's not covering the whole attack service where you still have to do manual verification because tools do not really understand the full context of the application. Awesome. So, like I said, here we have the, the whole uh, defect dojo, here we have the pipeline. And in the pipeline, as I showed you here in Azure, we have this OWASP meetup vault. So we also use the vault. So this is kind of a nice proof of concept how you could easily set up your whole CI CD environment or your whole security test automation. Excuse my French. Um, so like I said, everything's containerized. Everything runs in Kubernetes. So this is whole, all um, CI CD agnostic. So I can use this for VSCS, but I can use this just as easily for Jenkins or GitLab or I don't know, they, they also called vegetables like CICD. You also have, uh, I heard something, oh no, cucumber was end-to-end -end test, right? Yeah, all these weird stuff sometimes. Oh yeah, you have bamboo, but you won't eat bamboo probably. Some people might, it might not be my preference. So to make one thing clear, I think, When I mentioned it pulls an image, it gets the image from my Docker Hub, of course. So for my Docker registry. And you can also use your Azure, Azure registry, or you have your Google Cloud registry, or you have your own hosted registry, or you have your whatever somewhere registry. So you simply take your favorite security tool, you containerize it, you write your Kubernetes script, and it's good to go everywhere. So you do the whole configuration hell that really wants to you 
bash your head against the wall one time and then you're all good to go. It's good to run. You don't have to change it because we have this immutable infrastructure now. And if there's something else, if there's something else you wanted to do, you just simply go change your code, build, rebuild your container and then reuse it again. Pretty awesome if you ask me. So, now for the other part, I did a lot of renting. Um, are there any questions so far? And did you also containerize your application on the test in this case, or was it running somewhere else? My application on the test? No, I just, for dependency check, I just grabbed this outdated uh, uh, GitHub oh, okay. project from somewhere, and I did simply did an OWASP set uh, baseline scan on an application, so it's not really an intrusive scan, more a passive scan, where it checks Oh, for cookies with HTTP only flags and course configuration and that stuff. Okay. So because it for this uh, um, for this talk, it, for me it wasn't really about all the metrics it would generate because we all believe that if we run tools, they will find vulnerabilities and we can do stuff with those vulnerabilities. But it was more like, yeah, how are we, how are we going to build this whole setup and how will that probably looks like and most importantly, how are we going to manage all those vulnerabilities? Because like I said, if you do your, your, your test or your security test automation and you get this shitload report every time, let's say you have 200 <laughs> findings with 100 false positives. <laughs> My God, if you were to run through all those false positives every time you run a scan, you would probably go mad. And now imagine you are sitting in a sock and there are 50 development teams with their own projects. Well, good luck with that then. I think you will start a new career elsewhere. So, for me that was the most important part also, the whole how would you manage your vulnerabilities. Anything else? You run um, Dojo inside of a web app, is that in a Docker as well, or is it just natively in the web app? No, no, I run it uh, as a web app service within Azure, and it's just my container. It's also here. See? Defect Dojo. So it's containerized and run from there. So and you can why do you run it in a web app and not on your cluster? It runs in the cluster, but on Azure Pass, they call it web app. No, no, they call it web app. Yeah, but it's not running in your Kubernetes cluster. No, they pretend like it's running in your Kubernetes cluster because you get the option to give your Kubernetes config file where it doesn't really run in your cluster. That's correct. But uh, they like to pretend to me like it's running in Kubernetes, so I would like to pretend to the world like they pretend to me it's running in Kubernetes. But it's actually spinned up by the means of my Kubernetes config file I gave them. Somewhere in the, in, the, in, the, in the halls I heard they made some sort of a fork of the actual Kubernetes, so what you have in Azure isn't really Kubernetes, but some type-ish Kubernetes thingy-ish. It has an extension. Yeah. So any more questions? But you launch your other containers inside of your cluster. Yeah. So I still don't get why you run your dojo not in your cluster, but in a separate web app. So you can remove the cluster core, maybe? Well, the thing is, I, like I said, I'm lazy. So my defect dojo runs in the containers is the SQLite -like database. So for some reason, if it decides like, hi, this application is becoming unresponsive and it redeploys my app, all my precious data I gathered for okay. this proof of concept will be gone with the wind. It doesn't, it doesn't get data for multiple scans that you've done centralized or is this a single? That would be the ideal situation okay, if that, you're not lazy like, like me. Right, you just have the data store, the yeah. the results from the present. Exactly. If you were doing this on a production environment, <laughs> yeah, I would definitely recommend that. But as a procrastinator <laughs> and somebody who's quite lazy, <laughs> this is what's the best solution I could come up with. And it worked right, everybody's happy and you saw the whole idea of how to set up your security automation. So it served its purpose in that sense, so. Tell us all about it, all right. What's the next step in the roadmap? Are you going to include the function tests along with the security test? Because Zap, when you're running in baseline, it's basically checking a very minimal of uh, security. Yeah, yeah, but you could uh, run Zap as a full scan as well, right? Oh, 
So what I really want to do is keep the developer pipeline and the security pipeline separate from each other. Uh, Ideally, if you have uh, development teams, assign one security champion in the development team who takes the responsibility and ownership of your security. And don't let the rest of the developers even touch your security pipeline. Because as soon as they find something annoying, they turn it off. <laughs> like, oh, this is annoying. Let's turn it off. And then there goes your work into the bin lot. So please don't do that. Don't give your developers access to your security pipeline. I see that went wrong too many then times. It makes sense to give the security team access to that pipeline, or at least like the, the results are being produced. The security team will have the first vote on seeing like are these FPs or not, or mm-hmm. do they not make sense for context? Yeah. And then you would delegate to the team, to the security champion, and say, okay, this is work you need to do, right? You want to have a baseline, because otherwise, if you smack FPs into developer phases, they, they don't do a thing, right? I agree with you on that. Exactly. That I think you should move it from security team, and then that maybe selectively have a set of things you want to report to them, and then work from that, and allow it to grow, yeah. instead of just throwing that whole report on it. Exactly, because if you present all this stuff to the developers, they probably don't know what to do with it. They get overwhelmed and they will ignore it 100%. So that's why I said like, yeah. And and that will scale if you do that with champs in a big organization and have a pipeline. That's the whole game. Yeah, Yeah, definitely. (laughs) Any other questions? We still have time. Don't be shy. <laughs> I was shy at so first, but now... I, I have one. You are built at HKF, right? Yeah. How does that differ from Dojo? So Dojo is just your place where you manage your vulnerabilities, and SKF is where it helps you select the right security requirements. So that's beforehand, even before you start developing. So, fun fact, if we go to Defect Dojo, so then it becomes maybe becomes clear if I go to test types you can see here that you can also import the security requirements from SKF in Defect Dojo so SKF gives you the opportunity to manage your requirements from there because if you have nothing else it's a good start point but ideally everybody says we want to import it into Jira or we want to import those security requirements into <coughs> Defect Dojo or whatever. So that's where you, you generate your set of security requirements and this is basically yeah, where you manage your vulnerabilities. <coughs> and you can also manage the security requirements from here. Thank you. Yeah, cool. You're welcome. <laughs>